Okay, um, yeah, I think we can get started. It's one o'clock. So good afternoon to everyone. I trust everyone attending today as well. Um, today's webinar session will cover cutworm management. While this session is scheduled for two hours, I suspect it will end before that. Crop advisors can then use the extra time to complete the very easy assessment under category one on the CPD system before heading to the bar for a well-deserved beer. A good deal in my view. Lastly, please forgive me if I drop off for a few seconds. <clears throat> there is load shedding in my area, so there may be some interruptions every now and then. Hopefully not. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, in terms of the content, we will start with the brief introduction and then move on to the origin and distribution of cutworm species. Under identification, cutworm eggs, larvae, pupae, and moths will be covered. Host plants will be noted, as well as the life history characteristics of cutworms. <clears throat> the importance of getting cutworm control right will be communicated. Under detection, the importance of scouting will be highlighted. Management strategies will be discussed, and this will involve genetically modified maize, natural enemies, cultural methods, weed control, and not forgetting insecticides. As always, the best will be left for last, where the resistance question pertaining to pyrethroids and cutworms will be dealt with. Finally, in closing, the way forward will be outlined. Without wasting any more time, let's get straight into it. Okay, so cutworms are a group of insect species belonging to the moth family Noctuidae. Yes, everyone, cutworms are indeed moths and not worms. This is what every entomologist will tell you. Now, there are several cutworm species belonging to the genus Agrotus present in South Africa. These are black cutworm, as you'll see here, gray cutworm, brown cutworm, as you see here, spiny cutworm, and the common cutworm, Agrotus segatum, as you see here. The common, now, the common cutworm is the most prominent and economically important pest species present in the country. When looking at, orig when looking at origin and distribution, sorry guys, I think I dropped off there a bit, but yeah. So when looking at origin and distribution, um, of cutworm species, the black cutworm is found worldwide, but its origin remains uncertain. The brown cutworm was first described from Kenya and is also found in the east and northeastern parts of South Africa, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, and Madagascar. The great cutworm species appears to only occur in South Africa. And note the key word here appears with regard to great, great cutworm. There is no conclusive answer as yet. The common cutworm is present throughout Africa, Europe, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. Going forward, uh, we'll be speaking about cutworms in general, in general terms, where the focus will be will largely be placed on the common cutworm. Why? Because as I said, the species is considered the most economically important in the country. With that said, I will touch on other species where, poss where possible to illustrate certain points. Now let's move on to identification. Okay, cutworm eggs tend to be pale and whitish, but white and whitish, but later develop a reddish pattern on a paler background, resulting in a pinkish brown appearance, as you guys can see here. Although the picture quality is not very good, I think it paints the, the points I've made. Eggs can be laid singly or in clusters. Cutworm eggs are smaller than one millimeter, about 0 0.5 millimeters, millimeters in diameter, and are either laid on foliage or on the soil surface near plants. Now, this is why many people refer to the larval stages of noctuid pests as worms, because as you all can see, to someone who has no field experience, that looks like, that looks like a worm. For all of you here today, this stage will no longer be referred to as worms, which is common out there, but rather as larvae. Tatuam larvae body color may vary until the final instar. Fully grown larvae 
are thick, hairless, and approximately 30 to 40 millimeters long and grayish brown, often with a slightly greasy appearance where some specimens may appear more brown, more, more brown as we see here than gray. When disturbed, the larvae usually curl up tightly and resemble the shape of the letter C, as we sort of see here. These larvae are only fit for one purpose, in my view, bait on, on a hook for fishing. Now, before moving on to the pupae, it is important that everyone understands that it is the larval stage which feeds on crops, particularly during the seedling stages of crop development. This is why the larvae are commonly referred to as the pest, as the pest destructive stage of a nocturnal pest life cycle. In addition, this is why management measures target the cutworm larvae either directly or indirectly. All, all registered insecticides, for example, are aimed at controlling the larvae. Spraying the moths is a futile exercise since they are mobile and pesticides generally will not penetrate their fine body scales. Now, commonly referred to as the resting stage by may, many entomologists, cutworm pupae are approximately 20 millimeters long, depending on the species. Cutworm pupae, regardless of species, are formed in the so are formed in the soil near feeding sites. Hey, the adult moths have a wingspan of uh, of about 30 to 40 to about 30 to 45 millimeters. The four wings vary in color between grayish and brown. Four wing markings of kidney and circle shape, as we see here, are distinct for the common cutworm and veins are generally thin, dark brown lines. Female forewings tend to be darker than males, but are otherwise similar. The female hind, uh, hind wings are gray, whereas the male hind wings are white silver with the light purple tinge, as we can sort of see here. Now, the general appearance of cutworm moths are brownish with the distinct four, with, with distinct four wing markings, depending on the species, as illustrated here between the between the common cutworm and the black cutworm moths. Where the four wing markings on the black cutworm are sort of your dagger shaped, as we see here, near the outer edge of each four wings. So we can see while they may have similar colorings, the markings are, are, are distinct for each species. Okay, the cutworm pest destructive stage of which refers to the larvae, as you all know now, are polyphagous and attack most vegetable crops in addition to a wide range of grain crops, which includes wheat, maize, rice, barley, oats, rye, and sorghum, and not forgetting other examples like chicory, cotton, tobacco, ornamentals, eucalyptus, pine, and wattle trees. Many weeds and grasses are common alternative hosts. Now, what is meant by an alternative host? Alternative hosts of alternative hosts of similar plant family as of the primary host will help a crop pest to survive during the period when main hosts are not seasonally available and while the pests subsequently migrate back onto the main host plants. In simple terms, cutworms are able to utilize weeds in the absence of crops to complete their life cycles, making them a persistent pest throughout the year. This is an important point uh, to note when we get into management strategies. Okay, cutworm larvae and their moths are nocturnal and seldom seen. The larvae are usually only encountered when farm workers or gardeners work in the soil or when inspecting the soil near damaged plants. Based on available information, the life cycle of cutworm species in South Africa would appear to be much the same. Female moths deposit eggs in clusters on foliage and may lay up to 2,000 eggs in their lifespan. Eggs may take three to six to hatch. The number of larval instars varies, but there may be up to nine. Now, what do we mean by larval instars? And no, we are not talking about stars you see in the sky. An instar is the name given to the developmental stage of an arthropod, in this case, an insect between, in this case, an insect between molts. For example, after hatching from egg, the larvae is said to be in its first instar. When the larvae molts, it is then a second instar and so on. Regarding cutworm larvae, as mentioned just now, they can go through nine instars before pupation. Now, the duration of the larval stage varies between three to six weeks, 
or much longer in cold environments. Final instar larvae tunnel down into the soil to a depth of up to 120 millimeters to pupate. Moths emerge from pupae after about one to three weeks or longer in winter. The duration of the life cycle is generally around one to two months. Now, as all of you studious souls would have picked up, developmental time from egg to adult is variable, and the question now becomes why. The answer is simple. Insects are exothermic or cold-blooded, and their body temperature and growth are affected by the surrounding environmental temperature. Every insect requires a consistent amount of heat accumulation to reach certain life stages, such as egg, egg hatch, larvae to pupae, or adult flight. Therefore, developmental time from egg to adult will vary between regions depending on environmental conditions, in particular temperature. Going back to the common cutworm for reasons already highlighted, female moths lay approximately 1,000 eggs that hatch within a few days in summer. The pest destructive larval stage lasts for about three weeks while the pupil stage lasts as little as 12 days. It's no secret that farmers, advisors, and extension personnel in particular know the importance of getting cutworm management right since it is the first insect pest that presents a threat in the growing season. This is not new information, but for those who may not know exactly why, and to reiterate what some of you will already know, please listen carefully. Hey, larval feeding can result in severe damage to crops during the seedling stage. The larvae move from one seedling to another, cutting and destroying the stems of seedlings close to ground level, which often results in death. One larvae can damage numerous plants in a single night. When outbreaks occur and if not detected early, replanting of the crop has to be done. Given the nocturnal feeding behavior of the larvae in the daytime, they can be found close to the soil, soil surface near dead seedlings. Damage resulting from cutworm larvae is not only restricted, restricted to seedlings, Plants at the four leaf stage or older may also be damaged. This damage can be identified in older plants as round holes into the stem just below the soil surface. For all of you here, let me quickly tell you about my experiences at the KwaZulu-Natal Department of Agriculture. To put into context the importance of detection and monitoring. <clears throat> now, whenever advisory officials or farmers came to me to report a disaster, as they called it, due to a pest, whether insect or disease that targeted a particular crop. It was clear that all situations could have been avoided where detection monitoring protocols in the form of pheromone traps, for example, or physical scouting were in place. In all such cases I dealt with, the first question I asked was whether the crop was being inspected for pests or whether there were other detection protocols in place to identify a potential pest problem early. The answer was a, resou a resounding no. And to me, this is where a lot of producers fall short, particularly, particularly the smallholders. More often than not, the producers had to start again or had to rely on much higher usage of pesticides to get the infest in infestation outbreak under control. The other question I commonly asked was whether the crop was inspected to determine whether the initial application had been, su had been successful or in situations where pheromone traps were employed, where the records had been kept on moth counts. Again, the answer was a resounding no. In pest management, the importance of detection monitoring cannot be overstated. Not only to detect a problem, but assess the effectiveness of management strategies. This, to me and to many out there as well, forms the basis of, an in, of any integrated pest management program. Now let's have a look at cutworms in this context. Firstly, there are no registered pheromone lures for cutworm moths. Scouting for eggs is not ideal or practical for this pest in my view. So that just leaves us with the larvae, but not just the larvae. While it is of vital importance to get the identity of the pest right in order to determine suitable corrective actions for the crop, pe for the crop pest situation, what most will see first is the key characteristic damage symptoms, and that will give you a clear indication of the culprit. Let's have a closer look at why producers need to scout and how this can be done with regard to cutworms. Okay, given the importance I discussed earlier on why cutworm management needs to be on point, scouting constitutes one of the best weapons producers have in their arsenal to combat cutworm. 
Emerging crop seedlings must be continuously inspected for signs of cutworm, preferably twice per week, and treated when necessary. Scouting pulse spraying is vital to determine if the initial application was successful or if a sec second application, depending on the label of a product, is required. Producers who apply insecticides as a preventative measure must also scout to determine if the application was successful. The edges around bare regions should be inspected by producers for recently cut plants. In addition, the top five centimeters of soil should be thoroughly searched for larvae. Where any notched, vaulted, dead, cut weed or crop seedlings are observed, digging around roots of the plants to identify cutworm larvae, larvae should be initiated. Remember, weeds serve as alternative hosts. Moving on, let, let's take a look at cutworm management strategies. Okay, let's start with genetically modified maize. Now I have to be clear here that genetically modified maize are commonly referred to as BT maize. While effective against stock borers, BT maize is ineffective when it comes to cutworm. Please remember that everyone. The reason it's simple, cutworm and stalk borers are different species. Cry proteins in BT maize are species specific and the size of the larvae becomes crucial. In simple terms, the bigger the larvae, the less effective the cry proteins. Cutworm larvae which target maize seedlings are generally large, late instar larvae. I want to impress upon everyone listening here today to be vigilant of any seed companies claiming that the BT gene will control cutworm larvae. This is patently false based on the reasons I've just highlighted and the fact that there are no registrations under Act Number 36 of 1947 in this regard. If you see cutworm damage of the plant emergence in this instance, apply a registered insecticide to control the larvae. Cutworm eggs, larvae, and pupae are preyed upon by a wide range of natural enemies before the larvae burrow into the soil. Wasps, ants, and ground beetles play an important, play an invaluable role in controlling cutworm populations. Now, although predation by these natural enemies is not enough to prevent economic damage during outbreaks, these insects are of the utmost importance in preventing more regular, large-scale outbreaks. In this regard, what I am saying here is that when pesticides are used, they must be used responsibly and with care. Now, very quickly for those here today who may not know what cultural methods of control are, simply put, cultural methods are, cultural control methods are agricultural practices used to enhance crop health and prevent weed, pest, or disease problems without the use of chemical substances. For many, the most common cultural control method that comes to mind is crop rotations to break the cycle of a particular pest. You will all remember when I covered hosts, when I covered the host, the variety of crops that I attacked. This clearly indicates that rotations will not be an effective solution given the many different crops attacked by this pest. To add to what I said earlier regarding weeds as alternative cutworm hosts, and to put the importance of controlling weeds into context, weed species with aerial parts covering an extended surface area can create an ideal habitat for cutworm larvae and accommodate many more of the pests than small or spindly weeds. Between 20 and 30 larvae per plant in the case of Senecio species, better known as ragwort, and 77 larvae per plant with regard to Coniza bonariensis, <coughs> commonly referred to as fleabane, have been reported. Now, <coughs> now, <coughs> excuse me. Now, conventional practices of tillage of tilling in the form of plowing well before planting is aimed at destroying winter weeds and any volunteer plants present in the field. The larvae which become buried or exposed on the soil surface might be damaged or injured or taken by birds, lizards, frogs, and so forth. As the famous saying goes, the early bird catches the worm. Frost also kills the exposed larvae in areas where frost occurs. Essentially, the timeliest destruction of weeds prevents the early instar larvae that may already be in the soil from feeding and also denies the female moth a site for oviposition. Where practically possible, land should be plowed 35 days before planting and keep them free of weeds and volunteer plants until planting. In this regard, weeds on contour banks and land perimeters cannot be ignored. 
Now, this is what we read online or in publication, but how is this being conducted on the ground? On the ground, generally speaking, at least seven to 10 days before planting the soil is plowed, but note here that insecticides will likely be required depending on cutworm population levels in an area. Now, what about no-till farmers who do not plow fields? Well, controlling weed still remains critical, but this now involves the use of herbicides. Although reduced and no-till practices bring about many benefits to the environment, in particular the soil, as many of you will know, they also pose some challenges with regard to weed control, such as requiring increased herbicide use. The application of herbicides well before planting is a very effective method to control cutworm. A minimum period of 35 days prior to planting is needed in order to starve the larvae. And again, weeds on contour banks and land perimeters must also be controlled. Now what, I, now, what I have said is all good and well, but what is the common strategy being used by no-till farmers, particularly when it comes to weeds in maize fields? Well, based on my conversations with some farmers in this regard, this generally entails a burn down using a herbicide before planting. But again, insecticides will have to be relied upon to efficiently manage cutworm, and this will be discussed in more detail under insecticides. Now, it, it's also important to keep in mind that if you have planted a herbicide tolerant maize variety, you may need to apply herbicide after seeding emergent to kill off weeds, as well as insecticide to control the cutworm. The take home message when it comes to weeds and cutworms is that weed control is of vital importance in the fight against the pest <clears throat> and pre-planting weed management is crucial. Now let's have a closer look at the insecticides. Okay, so generally speaking, applications of suitably registered pyrethroids and organophosphates according to label are considered effective in controlling cutworm larvae. Now let's have a close, now let's have a look at the label snippets on this slide. <clears throat> Firstly, pesticide labels when it comes to cutworms does not specify species. Labels just state cutworm, as you will all see and as I have highlighted for all of you. This means that registered pesticides will control all, cut, all cutworm larvae present in South Africa, regardless of species. <laughs> Secondly, we also see that some labels state all row crops or various crops or all field crops, as, as we can see here as well. And the reasons for this is due to the variety of crops, the crops this pest attacks. However, at the top on this label here, we see specific instructions for maize. This is important because it shows the importance of carefully reading the product label and understanding the crop pest situation. To expand further here, when I was looking at other labels of products registered for control, while maize is stipulated when it comes to cutworm, as one scrolls down, various crops are noted as well. What does one do here? Well, if your crop pest situation pertains to maize and cutworm, then follow the application rates for maize. Otherwise, if it is another crop, then refer to the application rates for various crops. It's, it's as simple as that, guys. Now, pyrethroids, for example, the active ingredients, lam lambda sahelithrin, delta methrin, cypermethrin, and so forth, based on my experiences, are the preferred choices for producers when it comes to cutworm control. Depending on the brand, these can be applied as preventative or corrective treatments. Other than pyrethroid, other than pyrethroids, base, bait formulations with the active ingredient sodium, fluosilicate or quinolophos are, are also considered effective. Overall, how registered insecticides against cutworm are chosen and used will dif differ between regions and will depend on, but not limited to, the severity of the pest infestation, scale of farming operation, the associated labor, and probably most importantly, the budget. In other words, it's not going to be a one shoe size fits all here. Let me bring everyone's attention and make it clear, clear that where reduced or no till is practiced, populations of cutworm will usually be high. And this I've pointed out on the label as well. All of you can read that very quickly. And therefore, scouting post application becomes crucial in such a situation to determine if a second application may be required. 
Also take note of other key points stated on labels. For example, the soil must be free of clods and excessive debris and should only be applied if the top three centimeters of the soil is moist, as we clearly see it stated here. It is important to read these instructions carefully. Pesticide companies have done copious amounts of research to compile the label instructions, and if not strictly followed, then efficacy against the target pest, in this case cutworm, cannot be guaranteed. During my time at KZN Dard, regardless of the target pest, many smallholder farmers approached me noting that a particular pesticide product they had purchased was not doing the job, and they suspected the product may be ineffective against the pest, thereby implying a possible resistance issue. However, when technicians were sent out to look at the, how the farmers were conducting their spray operations, it was usually found that label instructions in terms of dosage and application were not strictly followed and sprayers were not properly calibrated. This puts into perspective that it is easy to forget about the little things, which in the end can make a huge difference. Please keep that in mind, everyone. Sorry about that, just had to take a quick sip of water. Okay, moving on. I think I went too far ahead, yeah. So now let's take a closer look at controlling cutworm in the home garden, smallholder fields, and on commercial farming lands. It is important that everyone in an advisory role provides options in line with the situation. This is what I was always thought when I was starting out. The end user being advised then has the opportunity to weigh up the options and determine which best suits their situation, available resources, and wallet. Remember my previous statement, it's not a one shoe size fits all. This is what I aim to convey using examples of my own experiences. Now for the home food garden or subsistence farmer, before planting, Remove weeds which serve as alternative hosts for the pest. Tillage is an important tool to combat cutworm. The soil can be loosened with the garden hoe and turned to expose cutworms that may be present where a good stomp with your size 10 boot should take care of them. With that said, all cutworm larvae may not be uncovered by cultivation in this context. Hence, during emergence and growth, an insecticide may be required. Therefore, it remains important to scout, particularly during emergence and growth, as this presents the first line of defense, as already mentioned. Earlier, I stressed the importance of, identi of identifying damage early. Given the nocturnal nature of this pest, plants should be inspected in the morning when damage is fresh and easier to see. Remember to watch for plants cut off near the ground, wilting plants, and where this is observed, it is a sign of cutworm feeding. Check your garden for cutworms in the late afternoon and evening when cutworms are active. To confirm that cutworms are present, run your hand over the soil, rolling over soil clumps and other potential hiding places within at least one foot of the damage. Now where damage and larvae are discovered and again where practically possible or when faced with a lack of resources, physically remove and crush the larvae. Be sure to use gloves in this regard. Other than that most gardeners and as per my experiences look to pesticides to deal with such situations. <clears throat> now, now in South Africa, there are small pack pesticide products available for garden use. More often than not, a small pack bait product is applied directly around emerging crop seedlings or newly planted seedlings, which, serve, which serves as a barrier where cutworms will be lured to the bait before attacking plants. This is achieved by loosening the soil with the garden fork where the Bait is then sprinkled directly around the base of the plant. Where cutworms invade plants at a more advanced growth stage, of which is generally rare, but it, it does happen, a small packed pyrethroid such as cy cypermethrin may be used. Again, very important to remember that cypermethrin is used to drench the soil around the plants to kill cutworm larvae, where the spraying of plants is, in itself is ineffective. The soil must be thoroughly drenched to penetrate deeply and kill larvae before serious damage is inflicted. Moving on to smallholder farmers. Now here we have to take into account the different tillage practices as well. Either way, it remains crucial to control weeds. Those farmers practicing tillage well before planting and where the land is left bare, free of weeds and residue, cutworm populations are likely to be considerably lower. 
As communicated earlier, tillage is utilized to remove weeds and bury or expose the cutworm larvae to predators, generally seven to 10 days or longer before planting. A pyrethroid is usually then applied at planting as a preventative, cut, uh, as a preventative cutworm control measure. Hence, tillage is not solely relied upon in this generally happens at the same time when pre-emergent herbicides are applied. From my conversations with such farmers, they have noted only one such spray for cutworm being required in a season with no further issues. When asked why do they use a pyrethroid instead of a base, the reply is straightforward and I quote, it works for my farm, unquote. Now let's consider land area as well. We know that farming land area between smallholder farmers varies considerably in terms of hectares and for some, especially those with small scale operations, a bait may be preferably utilized during emergence based on scouting records where tilling has been practiced as a corrective treatment or alternatively pyrethroid products applicable to such situations. For the reduced and particularly the no-till farmers, we know cutworm numbers will be higher and pose a bigger threat due to insufficient or no soil cultivation. So in essence, reliance on chemicals will be a lot greater to manage cutworm populations. Farmers that I had discussions with before joining Crop Life chose to do a burn down 10 days or so before planting and at planting a pyrethroid is generally applied as a preventative measure to manage cutworms where this generally happens at the same time when pre-emergent herbicides are applied. Alternative, alternatively, some farmers may choose to apply a pyrethroid when doing a chemical burn down before planting where the pyrethroid is also used preventatively to manage cutworm. From my conversations with farmers in this regard, only one insecticidal spray as a preventative measure has been required to manage cutworm larvae with no issues thereafter. Before I move on to commercial farmers, again, land area needs to be taken into account. Some, some smallholders, again, with small scale operations may choose to do a chemical burn down using a herbicide. And instead of using a pyrethroid to control the cutworm larvae, a bait may be preferred after planting. Finally, commercial farmers, given the large scale of, the, of, the, of their associated operations, also need to take weed control seriously. Now again, strategies to manage cutworm will differ based on farming practices. For those practicing tillage, it will be similar to what I discussed for, farm hold, for, for smallholders, although baits in such situations would not be considered. Those with reduced and no-till systems, again, will rely on similar strategies discussed under smallholder farmers, but again, baits would not be considered in my view. Moving on. Now, when using a pesticide against cutworm larvae, keep the following in mind. While I have noted examples from my experiences, it is important to note that in some instances, particularly in regions with known high cutworm populations, a follow-up corrective treatment may be required. Hence, diligent scouting is crucial to determine whether the initial application was successful or whether a second spray may be required. When it comes to smallholder and commercial farming operations, given the threat of other key pest species, for example, stork borer or the tomato leaf miner, particularly, particularly in non-BT maize varieties, and vegetable crops such as tomatoes, spraying will likely continue into the vegetative growth stage and possibly beyond. Therefore, this makes sense as to why cutworms only really pose a threat during early seedling stages of crop growth. With that said, at the seedling stage, the crop is at its most vulnerable. Therefore, management needs to be spot on to avoid severe losses where replanting may be required. When an insecticide is to be utilized, try to, try to apply the insecticide during the afternoon. This reduces the degrading effects of heat and direct sunlight on the product and ensures that the larvae, which are nocturnal, receive maximum exposure to it. As mentioned, there are preventative and corrective treatments available to manage cutworm larvae. And when used correctly, according to label, there is no reason in my view why the larvae cannot be efficiently managed. Finally, always remember to use personal protective equipment, commonly referred to as PPE, whenever handling a pesticide product. The risks associated with pesticides can be negated by using the product responsibly. Remember, a hazardous chemical is like a tiger in a cage. Know and understand 
and respect the tiger that you are working with so that there are no unforeseen surprises. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Now, with all of that said, what exactly happened during the 2020-21 season? A relatively easy pest to manage at the start of a growing season and not quite considered as important as other crop pests, which, became, uh, which become problematic later on, cutworm started making headlines in agricultural news where the billion rand question of whether cutworms are developing resistance to pyrethroids featured prominently. So what exactly happened during this time? During the 2020-21 growing season, reports of extremely high infestation levels were received from the Basbank region in KwaZulu-Natal, where maize fields were planted in no-till. Planted no -till. In addition, similar reports were also received from the Botheville region in the Free State. Farmers believed that cutworms had developed resistance against pyrethroids. The reason for this being that the same lambda sahelothrin treatment strategy against cutworm used in previous seasons had been effective, but now this was no longer the case. During the 2021-2022 growing season, media reports again highlighted the serious damage cutworms had caused to farmers in their maize, potato, and other vegetable crop fields, where farmers again suspected resistance. Some entomologists argued otherwise. Certain entomologists argued in articles that the damage being witnessed was a result of cutworms changing their behavior by remaining and foraging below the surface, below the soil surface, although no data has been made available. This sudden behavioral change was attributed to the very wet uh, conditions and in some instances flooding that prevailed across most of the summer rainfall areas in the country. Some farmers had no choice but to replant much of their crops, whereas potato and vegetable farmers who experienced significant damage during the advanced growth stages were unable to replant. Now, after numerous discussions with Dr. Gerard Ferduan, who provided comments in many of the media articles and based on re reports he received after sending out the pest alert, as well as the information in the public arena, one would think that this issue was likely due to problems with application and crop and crop residues together with the amount of rain, uh, rain that was received. In general, based on the reports, the affected farmers did a chemical mowdown with glyphosate before planting where the pyrethroid lambda sahelothrin was mixed in for cutworm, for cutworm control, referred to, them, referred to by them as a common strategy, as I alluded to earlier. Dr. Ferduin suspects that this tank mix may not be a good option since the molecules may possibly interact or damage each other. Given that farmers affected were practicing no-till, cutworms may have escaped any pyrethroid that passed through the crop residues onto the soil surface during the very wet weather conditions experienced in the summer rainfall, air, in the summer rainfall regions. Dr. Ferduin, as quoted, believes that tank mix issues the crop residues, the wet soil, and a cutworm outbreak made life difficult for no-till farmers. Dr. Ferduin further provided me with an example of a farmer who converted from no-till to tillage well before planting in order to clear out weeds prior to applying lambda sahelothrin not mixed with glyphosate. And the farmer had and the farmer had no damage, whereas his neighboring farmers who continued with no-till and some were tilling, but used the lambda sahelothrin and glyphosate mix had up to 80% damage. The impact of tillage differs for various pest species. In this instance, as all of you will now know, tillage removes weeds and berries or exposes the larvae to predators. Thus, timely soil cultivation, in particular the removal of weeds, will have an effect on cutworms since the action removes the host, pl the host plants and therefore their food. A switch from no-till to minimum tillage in the form of ripping, as suggested by some, would have no effect on cutworm. But was such action really warranted by the farmer? Did the farmer consider all possibilities? And I think we need to delve into this a lot deeper to uncover exactly what, what, what went wrong here. Okay, so now 
in my conversations with the research agronomist, it was explained that their technical team applies cyclometrin as soon as planting is completed using knapsack sprayers in order to prevent cutworm damage to emerging May seedlings in research trials. The fields used for running trials are mostly conventionally tilled, but fields prepared no-till have been utilized with no difficulties in managing cutworms to date. The, the agronomist, however, agrees with Dr. Ferduan's views in that cutworms may not be effectively controlled in a no-till situation due to thick residue layers, particularly when it comes to larger farming operations, but believes that ripping alone would have a significant would have would not have a significant impact on cutworms. I also spoke to a farm manager in KZN, where I asked for an opinion on, on the resistance question given the vast experience past years of experience this individual has in managing cutworm under no-till operations. The manager noted no issues in controlling cut, cutworm larvae with only one pyrethroid treatment, either cypometrin or deltametrin ever being required. Cutworm resistance to certain pyrethroids has, has been a hot topic. Give me a second, guys. I just need to have a quick sip of water. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, let me get back to it. Now, cutworm resistance to certain pyrethroids has been a hot topic in pest management. What is becoming clear is that cutworm resistance to pyrethroids is certainly not the issue. Further, no reports were received via the pest alert from farmers practicing conventional tillage. While a switch from no-till to minimal, minimum tillage in the form of ripping is unlikely to have a profound effect, it would appear that the problem lies with the crop residues preventing the spray mixture from reaching the larvae in sufficient amounts to bring about appreciable control. With that being said, one must also consider the experiences of the agronomist and farm manager I spoke to, whom have had no, ex no issues in managing cutworm under no-till conditions. So, What's, what's actually going on here? This leads one to question whether the practice of mixing lambda cyhalothrin, in particular, and glyphosate should be recommended in no-till operations. Is it as simple as just changing to cypometrin or deltametrin? Based on what has been discussed, one would now think that perhaps there may be issues with tank mixes pertaining to glyphosate and lambda cyhalothrin, based on where the discussion now currently sits. But have we considered all angles when it comes to tank mixes, such as spray water, hardiness, pH? As all of you will see, that pinpointing the exact cause is not as easy as ABC. From a chemistry perspective in particular, questions still remain. And this is why I have invited Dr. Gerard Ferduen in his capacity as an accomplished and highly respected organic chemist to have a discussion with me today. Gerard, are you there? I'm on standby, Rish. Great, Gerard. Thank you for making the time to be part of this discussion today, Gerard. And I think as you can see now, the conversation is getting quite tricky around this. So let me not waste any more of your time and let's jump into the first question, Gerard. Mm -hmm. So my first question to you, based on what I've just said now, um, do pyrethroid molecules re react differently in tank mixes with herbicides in your capacity as an organic chemist? Okay, thanks, Yerish. I'm going to speak purely as an organic chemist with uh, a couple of, of years' experience behind me with um, organic chemistry being a synthetic organic chemist and also a practicing toxicologist. So I think I know the hearts and minds of chemistry more than I know the hearts and minds of people. And if I look at the common practice, and I'm going to refer to the most common practice, which is a mixture of lambda cyclothrin with uh, glyphosate, then as an organic chemist, I get the shivers. Now, I, I can't present anything here today. It wouldn't have made any sense. But let me give you some background on the two molecules. First of all, talking about lambda cyclothrin 
And for the same matter, we can also bring in cypermethrin or alpha cypermethrin or delta methrin into the same discussion. So the pyrethroid molecules are, are basically not very polar molecules, so they don't have any acidic moieties or they don't have any hydroxyl groups in the moieties, but they do carry, in most cases, a cyano group, which is very important. Now, remember, cyano means it's a carbon bonded, triple bonded to a nitrogen atom, which sits somewhere on the molecule. And in the case of the lambda, in particular lambda salathrin, it, con it contains also a trifluoromethyl group, which is important in terms of the way in which the molecule reacts in the target organism. And then in the case of most of the pyrethroid molecules, on the pyrethrin side of the molecule, there's a, there's a double bond. So the double bond um, and the cyano group are the two most important parts of discussing the behavior of the pyrethroid in the tank mix with anything, whether you talk about pure water or alkaline water because of um, alkalinity or brackishness, whatever, or city conditions and whatever like this. Now, I have to talk also about the the very favorite um, herbicide, namely glyphosate. So glyphosate is a phosphonic acid. It's a very simple molecule with two very important parts of the molecule, actually three very important parts of the molecule. The molecule consists of a phosphonic acid head. Um, in other words, it looks very much like a, a typical phosphonic acid. So it's a phosphorus double bonded with hydroxyl or, or with oxygen and then two hydroxyl ions, which are OH. Um, and on the other side or the tail end of the molecule, there's an organic acid, which is carbon double bonded to oxygen and hydroxyl group. And then in the middle is there also a nitrogen atom, which is bonded to two um, alkaline groups or not, yeah, not alkaline groups, alkyl groups in the molecule. And it also has a proton sitting on it. Other words, hydrogen ions sitting on top of it. So looking at the nature of um, glyphosate. So glyphosate is basically like a phase transfer agent. It's also a detergent. So don't take my word for this and don't do it at home. But if um, you take some glyphosate onto your hands and you've got grease on your hands and you wash your hands with that, it acts like a detergent. So it is actually a very good detergent. And it was discovered many, many, many years ago as a herbicide when somebody tried to to develop a detergent, and it came out that this detergent is actually a, a very powerful and very successful herbicide because of the two ends of the molecule that act in as a phase transfer agent between certain parts of water and whatever else is in the mixture. So if you add then this molecule, which is an organic acid and a phosphoric, phosphonic acid to pure water, it will drop the pH of the water um, at least one unit down from neutrality. Let's say you work with neutral water spot on 7 pH. It will drop the pH down because it is a weak organic acid. But if you add that pyrethroid or that, that um, glyphosate molecule into a tank mixture with a pyrethroid like lambda salathrin or delta methrin or um, cypermethrin for that matter, there is a very, very good possibility that there's going to be an interaction between the um, glyphosate molecule and the pyrethroid molecule because you remember I said in the beginning there's a cyano group, a carbon triple bonded to nitrogen in the pyrethroid molecule. Now nitrogen in the case of both the um, uh, glyphosate and in case of the pyrethroid carries an unbonded um, pair of electrons and that's what we call a proton scavenger. So it's looking for protons, in other words H plus in the tank mixture. And when you dissolve the um, glyphosate in water, it automatically has the ability to dissociate into the parent molecule as an anion and then as a proton floating around in the molecule. And if that proton hits the cyano group on the pyrethroid, it automatically protonates the, the, the um, uh, cyano group in the molecule. And if that molecule then enters the receptor site on the target organism, which is the hoho, it may not work effectively because it changes the behavior of the molecule. And that cyano group is very important in terms of the receptor site to do the right job to kill the organism, which is your um, the insect. Secondly, again, going back to a pure tank mixture with good water, 
um, with a phosphonic acid like glyphosate and a pyrethroid. Again, on the other side of the pyrethroid molecule with a double bond, double bonds are notorious for picking up water. In other words, H2O, which in water is formed between hydroxyl group OH minus and H plus. And if you have H plus floating around in the tank mixture coming off the organic acid from um, the glyphosate, then that can start protonating the double bond and the double bond can pick up something else. So it can actually make a new molecule out of the pyrethroid and out of the organic acid, which is the glyphosate. And that will not have any effect on the insect. It will also not have a, the desired effect on um, on the weed that you're trying to control. So that is very simple, basic organic chemistry between two molecules. Now add onto that the fact that most of the water that we have in the country, um, I'm not talking about what's supposed to be potable water from the tap, but I'm talking about farm water which come, might come out of a dam or a bottle is never optimal water. So the farmers would first have to stabilize the water's pH and buffer the water to make sure it is buffered properly to a pH of anything between normally, hopefully between 5.7 and 7.4 for the optimal range of most of the, the pesticides that we use. But you add something to the water to, to, to buffer the water. So that might, might be ammonium chloride, it might be ammonium phosphate, it might be ammonium sulfate that it's added to it. And even those molecules can have an effect on a pyrethroid or something like a, a glyphosate. That is not the most important thing because normally when the water is properly buffered, those buffering agents won't have an impact on the active ingredient. But the problem comes in, if you buffer poor water with a lot of calcium hydroxide in the water, which is lime, that calcium is definitely going to have a severe impact on the efficacy of the um, glyphosate because even in buffered water, there is going to be an interaction between the phosphonic acid, uh, which is called glyphosate, and the calcium or the lime. It might even go as far as tapping two of the um, glyphosate molecules and precipitating them out in the tank. You won't see it because it's going to be in the form of the salt, which in the salt is where something precipitates out, but it is in a in a microscopic form of a few microns, not even in the terms of, of a couple of millimeters. So those things are not observable, even though, even though they might happen. Um, the problem comes also in um, when you talk about what type of glyphosate am I using? Remember, we've got glyphosate SL, which is the pure glycinic acid. We've got glyphosate potassium salt, we've got glyphosate sodium salt, we've got trimesium salts, we've got isopropylamine salt, and we sometimes have other types of salts. And um, that also makes a difference in, in how the um, glyphosate works in the water. And it will have a profound impact on on the pyrethroid molecule. So remember, and I'm going back to, to grade seven chemistry, if you have the salt of a molecule like um, glyphosate, let's say we talk about the potassium salt. Remember, potassium comes off potassium hydroxide, which is a very strong base, and the glyphosate is a, is a weak organic acid. And the basic chemi chemical principle tells you that the salt of a strong base and a weak acid is also is always an alkaline solution. In other words, you have an alkaline solution where you use potassium salt of glyphosate together with a pyrethroid, which doesn't bode well for a pyrethroid because they don't like the alkaline conditions. So if you add pure glycine to a pyrethroid, it's not as bad as adding something which is a salt form, even if it is the isopropylamine salt, because even isopropylamine is not going to be favorable towards a pyrethroid molecule. And looking at a chemical perspective at a, at a pyrethroid molecule with isopropylamine, which is quite a strong um, inorganic um, base, that is going to create havoc with that pyrethroid molecule. It might even break it up into the pyrethrum part of the molecule and into the other organic part of the molecule, which can is a cyano group, and that means that the molecule cannot work at all. Another thing which might have an effect, <clears throat> which I have no doubt about, is that when you work with um, most of the pyrethroids, or some of them, are in a CS form, or sorry, in, in an in a EC form. So in other words, it's an emulsifiable concentrate. So there's an emulsifying agent, 
and there's a solvent and the solvents are very often something like for example um, xylene so xylene will have an effect then on not on the pyrethroid because it's in the xylene formulation but it might have an effect in on the phosphenic acid which you never buy in the form of a formulation with an ec in terms of glyphosate and then if if the companies add that wonderful emulsifying agent called in methylmorpholine that is going to create all sorts of havoc with something like um the uh, the herbicide called glyphosate. So there are so many reasons from a chemical perspective without looking at the performance perspective why it is not a good idea to mix a pyrethroid and glyphosate in the same tank because chemically the two are not really compatible. And um, the question is always from my perspective, if I'm a farmer and I pay a small fortune for the pesticide, whether it's a herbicide or the insecticide, I expect the optimal performance when I do it strictly according to the label. But if I make a mistake and I don't go according to go according to the label and I do a mix of stuff or I don't use good water, then I'm not going to get what I paid for and I'm going to actually waste my money and not only the wasting the money on the chemical itself, but remember you have tractor time, you've got diesel or you've got manpower time or woman power time because it's all those things coming into what we call the agricultural inputs um, price for that particular exercise. So chemically, nope, it doesn't make sense to me. And I'm saying it purely as an organic chemist, not as an agriculturalist or as a farmer. Yeah. So I hope that gives a bit of a perspective on the intricacies of, of um, molecules interacting in a spray tank. Yeah, thanks for that, Gerard. You make a bold statement there, I think. Um, and, and then now my question is, as a follow-up question to that, Gerard, I, I then need to ask you, um, even from my experiences, this has been going on now for quite a while. Why? Could, could, could it not have been also the weather conditions that further exacerbated cutworm population numbers as well? Because if we look at it, Gerard, you make good points here uh, chemically, but... Um, Previous seasons would show that um, the, these strategies have worked um, because what you are telling me now, you're not purely focusing on the lambda, you're focusing on pyrethroids as a whole. Yeah. And other than lambda, I haven't had any or seen any reports pertaining to the others. And these are strategies that are being used quite a quite a bit in the fields out there. So, Gerard, how do, how then is it effective and still effective for a lot of farmers, but only for these certain farmers? Um, or the reports that were received by your pest alert that there was a problem here. Could it, and, you, and I think you touch on things like pH of the water and things like that, which I think will have, make a difference because we know with pyrethroid molecules, they have certain pH levels where they perform optimally and not optimally. So it depends on the pH of the spray water and the mix thereafter. Yeah. So that's my question to you, Gerard. Um, chemically, you've given me um, your reason, but Looking at it in, in the context of the whole situation here, Gerard, um, you know, you make a bold statement there about pyrethroids, but I think anybody farming or anybody, you know, in an advisory role or in government as well, you know, they've they've done this and it's 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 been a method that's been working and continues to work, you know. Um, whether they're mm -hmm. applying it mixed or not mixed, it doesn't really matter. The pyrethroids have worked. So therein lies my question to you, Gerard, is is it not a little bit more, um, maybe a, a field it's, issue or something yeah. like that? No, it's definitely more because um, I spoke to, well, it happened, I, I think it was the first year of COVID when I started getting the the calls from farmers, from especially from Kozlo Natal and from Boerteville, first in the Free State and then the entire Free State and the, even other parts of the country, which was the summer um, rainfall areas and um, the question one has to ask yourself but why is it that all of a sudden there was this massive problem mm. yeah. with the control of, of the cutworm That's and it, it is not only chemically related but you remember mm. at that time the country was basically drenched some of the farms yeah. in the free state washed down to the Limpopo River and they ended up in the harbor in Mozambique so um, 
the, the rainfall was excessive. And I asked a, a very good colleague of mine, Desiree van Heeren, that some of you might know, she's an entomologist just that we used to work at um, Syngenta. And she's one of these people, and I'm glad to see also today on the call, Professor Johnny van den Berg. These are the people that walk around and they never without the loop, which is that little magnifying glass with them. So they dig into the soil, they dig into the plants and they go and see what's going on. And I asked Desiree, because at that time, I was completely dumbfounded that I got, I can't tell you, but um, if I'm talking about tens of calls in a week from farmers about the cutworm outbreak, I'm not lying to you. And I asked Desiree, but please give me your perspective, because remember, I'm a chemist. I build chemical molecules. I'm not an entomologist. I just know there's a worm that's causing a problem, and it's causing a problem for the farmers. And Desiree went out to the free state on her own, and she went around to the farmers and called me up, and she said to me, the problem lies not only in the fact that there might be a tank mix problem, but there's also a definite problem with the drenching of the soil. And what she found and what other people also told me is that because of the excessive rain and the, the very soil, wet soil conditions, the insects or the, the insect larvae changed their biology completely. So in other words, instead of working um, or being active on above the soil, uh, level at night, they start operating below soil level. And that's why they went unnoticed by many farmers. Um, and that's what Desiree found, that they burrowed much deeper into the soil than normally. So the expectation is then, if you apply your pyrethroid, and remember pyrethroids <clears throat> have a very high um, soil absorbent coefficient. In other words, if you apply to the soil, and you don't work it into the soil, that's going to get bound by the soil or on the clay particle in the soil for the first 25 to 30 millimeters um, in the in the top echelon of the soil. It won't go any deeper unless you really irrigate a hell of a lot to get it into the soil. But there's also the back pressure from soil, which is completely drenched, so it doesn't work. And my suspicion then was confirmed by by Desiree that there was something else in there, and we we pointed our fingers very strongly at the fact that the soil was completely drenched. Now, later on <clears throat> in the season, I started getting the calls from the black farmers who were complaining about severe cutworm outbreaks in especially the cabbage because these guys plant lots of cabbage and spinach and tomatoes. And they also told me the same. I told them, go and dig for me and tell me what you see. And they found the cutworms at very deep levels down um, where they normally don't find them. And I told them, well, now you've got to actually dig around your plants and you've got to put your cutworm bait under the soil to protect your plants against um, against the cutworm. But then in my discussion later on with Desiree and with other people, it all came back to the, the, the practices or the agricultural practices. And I'm going to talk here again as an organic chemist. If you look at something like uh, glyphosate and you look at something like um, a pyrethroid and Forget about lambda, but but lambda is always the come, one coming up because that's the preferred one, according to most of the farmers for the cutworm control. If you apply those two chemicals, either singular or in a tank mixture, onto a completely no-till crop field, and yeah, I'm not against that. I'm very much a supporter of that because of the soil conservation, but it creates other problems for the farmers. So if you apply that onto a no-till crop field with a lot of crop residues, just the simple principle of organic chemistry is that the crop residue there is very porous, it's organic of nature, it absorbs the chemicals, <clears throat> and in the case of, for example, the pyrethroids, they will not be liberated from that organic matter on top of the soil. The pyrethroid is going to sit there and it's going to be biologically unavailable, even though the molecule is not destroyed by anything it is going to be biologically unavailable. It is as simple as saying to yourself also, if I apply pyrethroid in a very high in a very high clay content soil, I'm talking about the clay minerals like kaolinite or montmorillonite, which are clay part clay minerals, they they basically bind these molecules onto them virtually irreversibly and slowly but surely they get broken down microbially by the microbes in the soil. And very much the same will happen with the uh, phosphenic acid glyphosate. It goes into the stubble or let's say the, the maize residues on the plant and um, it is it is more prone to chemical or to biochemical degradation than a pyrethroid. Even though it's got a much longer half-life than a pyrethroid in normal soil, 
in the plant matter itself, there's going to be microbial activity there that will start eating up both the pyrethroid molecule and then also the phosphonic acid, which is glyphosate. So I see that as a problem in terms of the efficacy of applying either as a singular or the tank mix your, your glyphosate and the pyrethroid because it goes on to a surface which is not the soil surface. You're talking about an organic surface which is littered with plant material and that plant material is, is never completely dead. It is full of microbes. It might be fungi, there might be some viruses, but there will also be a lot of, lot of bacteria, which is actually good for the soil, but not good for the chemistry. So if there's microbial activity in that plant residue, it has the tendency to produce enzymes that start eating up your expensive chemistry, and the chemistry will not do the job as expected. It might do some of the job, or it might not do the job at all because the molecules are what we call label. Label means they're sensitive towards um, microbial breakdown and to solar radiation breakdown like UV radiation or even to heat. So these are the things that we come up with. So first of all, I think, and I don't think so, I know for a fact that the wet conditions precipitated the massive outbreak of the, um, of the cutworms, but also the wet conditions just made everything, which it got six legs, boom in the country. There were caterpillars that we haven't seen for 20 to 30 years, beautiful, wonderful, massive caterpillars. And then obviously the typical bollworm, the um, and things like that. And the cutworms just exploded in numbers. On top of that, the soil was dense. So the cutworms decided, OK, now because we've got the wet soil, we operate underground. So that's what I think is an, an answer to your question there. Yeah, I think I think good points there, Gerard, and it also speaks to what what were the conditions of the field like. Um, I I have seen some no-till fields well managed, some not so so much. <laughs> um, yeah, Gerard, but you know also the possibility we can then say you know given what you said to us regarding control now, it may also be a possibility that weeds weren't uh, efficiently controlled um, prior to planting which could have still maintained the cutworm populations and exploded it with the lack of weather conditions that came after that. But just on that note as well, Gerard, while you touch on the cutworm explosion with the weather conditions, what, what I saw um, in the Sidara area while we were trapping for, for the stalk borer moths um, uh, for the Basiola fusca, um, we saw a complete dip after the flooding and we had some hectic rain on Sidara where there was a bit of flooding of the fields. And yeah, like I said, we saw a big drop in the numbers of uh, stock borer thereafter, and, and they never quite recovered. And that was in about January or so. <clears throat> so different pest species can be influenced uh, differently. Look, while we say rainfall, yeah. temperature, these mm -hmm. are conducive to pests, sometimes too much of it is, is also not conducive. So that's why things when you do like the temperature yeah. studies, you'll have your lethal mm -hmm. limits, and then you'll have your you know, your your lows and things like that. So at, well, basically what it's saying is that once the temperature hits this stage, um, development of the pest, you know, it's, it's not going to be likely. Or if the temperature is too low at this stage, development will also not be likely. And then you start try to sort of find, you know, where yeah. um, in between temperatures to maybe develop a degree day model, which would give you an idea of the number of generations you'd see in a particular area. Yeah. But then again, that has to be based on uh, data records of climatic uh, conditions in areas to be modeled uh, accurately. So yeah, Gerard, I think I think that's um, that that's now starting to to um, give us some clues. Um, and end of but, the day, uh, I think it goes back. Yeah, it goes back yeah. to what we say, Gerard. Many ideas, opinions of what could have happened. Um, we know that something did happen in the season, and one of the things that stand out, like you said were the very wet weather conditions that that came into play. But that also doesn't take away from the fact that maybe management may not have been quite on point in terms of the field sanitation and, yeah, and the well, control of weeds as well. I want to comment again on what you said about the uh, Buciola, the stalk border. So Desiree also confirmed for me, um, not only in 2020, but later on that the mm. wet conditions were not conducive to Buciola. So the Buciola infestation yeah. all over the place was much lower, but the cutworms continued because remember they are, they actually benefited mm -hmm. from the very soil, wet soil conditions. Yeah. So they buried underneath and they survived and they proliferated. And the, the 
cutworm issue remained. It was even an issue in the 2022 and summer 2023 three planting seasons. But I want to go back to the farmers that I'm, I'm working with in the Vaspunk area on a, on a total different topic. And that particular farmer um, is one of these people that always investigates and he wants to do the right thing. And he says he's a no-till farmer. Well, he was a no-till farmer until he got the, the heat by the cutworms and he had to do a triple planting to get himself a crop that was semi-viable and even then he battled with the cutworms. So he told me the next year, I asked him the next year, well, what did you do then? I'm not going to mention them. He said to me, he decided, well, this year he's going to nuke them by tilling and he did a proper till and then he did the normal application of his um, of his insecticide to control the cutworm and he had absolutely no impact and he said to me the people around him that continued with the same practices they used every year in other words no tilling um, and doing the application of the glyphosate and the lambda they had the similar effects of some of the fields up to 70 percent had to be replanted so i've always maintained to myself that um, no till is not the golden one for cropping it is one of the best tools in the market, but you must keep a finer finger on the pulse of the pests and the weeds because they can take over from you if you think that you're going to beat everything by zero till. So I think there are ample examples of how people overcame the problem that we found with the cutworm. And in my discussion with the black farmers, um, and I, I keep record of all of them, so I phone them back and ask them how it's going, and they tell, tell me yeah, when they work the cutworm bait into the soil, they find a much better effect than when they mm. put it on top of the soil. So yeah. we've got enough good anecdotal evidence, oh, even though it's not properly documented in terms of science. Um, there's good enough anecdotal evidence that, that the other practices do cut them back. But I'm coming back to what you said earlier on. We've got no evidence whatsoever that any cutworm is resistant to a pyrethroid. And um, I haven't seen that. Um, I've got no evidence to that. We have another from Desiree. I heard that Professor John F. de Berg doesn't have evidence to this, this. So it, it warrants proper investigation. But I stand on my head to say that it's not a resistance issue. It is a cultural and agricultural practice issue. Nothing else than that. Yeah, I think I think hundred percent, Gerard. A lot of uh, uh, com commentators out there would agree with you as well. In terms of, it's not a resistance issue; it's something else. But yeah, I mean, whatever it was, we also need to get on well, get get on top of that somewhat, um, Gerard. But then, with that said, was was a change now from no till to tilling? You know, was it really needed, Gerard, or was it drastic? Um, did he consider everything? And then I must yeah. also then, mm. then bring in my second question here, Gerard, as well. So while this may be one from, uh, uh, what, when we look at the other reports or the other reports and from your conversations with them, Gerard, um, could it have also been due to irresponsible tank mixing that maybe did not control the, the weed holes um, sufficiently prior to planting? Um, and I'm not talking about just adding maybe a buffer and acidifier or something like that. Um, were there other products perhaps mixed in, um, Gerard? We don't know. So maybe you could uh, shed some light on that one as well. Yeah. Um, the farmers I spoke to in the free state that phoned me up in the beginning with the um, cutworm issue and also the ones in KZN. Um, and I'm going to bring the black farmers also in here because some of them are smallholder farmers, some of them are commercial farmers. I regard those farmers as the more more sort of um, forward-thinking farmers. They they try and do things as responsible as they can and according to label. And yeah, there was definitely in most cases a tank mix between um, glyphosate and a pyrethroid. And I can confirm for you most definitely that the responsible farmers I spoke to did not have anything else in their tanks and they checked their pH in the water. So I asked them, please go and check for me. Is your water at the level of what we call potable water because anybody in our audience and our crop advisors today or distribution networks will tell you, you always tell a farmer your water must be at that level of potable water so the water was potable everything was done properly um, the problem came in with what we discussed early on with the rainfall and the way in which the cutworms changed their biology so that it wasn't actually i think so so much to do with an irresponsible tank mixing 
but I do know for a fact that we see lots of evidence of tank mixtures of up to seven things in a tank. And I ask myself, but <laughs> where mm. do you put the water yeah. into the tank? You know, so, um, but you also asked the question in the beginning of this, of this last question you posed, um, was the tilling just a drastic measure or was it required? Well, I recommend it to the farmers that I spoke to. If nothing works and you've been trying three times now and you've triple dosed the piety sort and you still don't get well, it, what yeah. is the best thing to do after that? And that's where he, the wet nearly mentioned the name. That's where the farmer said to me, now I'm putting my tractors in. I'm doing a proper till for the first time in eight years and he beat them up. And that's what I've also <laughs> said to farmers in in all the years I've been working with the, um, the gerbils that is also um, one of the main agricultural pests in the country is you don't have to till your fields every year, but as a as a good practice, maybe consider doing a proper till um, once in a five year cycle that you bury all the stuff, yeah. that you open the stuff, you aerate your soil, you bring the noise new soil to the top, you take your organic matter to the bottom where it can rot properly and form a good microbe colony. So that's what I uh, I sort of um, preach to farmers. No till is fine, but once in a while, you need to say to the tractor boys, right, now we go in and we till the farm properly, we do proper raking of the prop of, of, of the farm. And that is something which which is going to be required, I believe, in a case of proper weed control and proper um, insect control. And Desiree also told me that she found in some of the crop residues that's lying, lying in the field, she found the, the larvae and the eggs of the Buseola sitting there, just waiting for the new crop to come. And <laughs> she also found evidence of, um, for example, maize diseases. So it makes very much sense when you get to that point that you need to get rid of them in a mechanical way than just solely relying on on, on chemicals. And you know, you all know by now that crop life in Africa, together with all our crop life partners, right to international, we we pump the idea of integrated pest management very, very hard. So don't mm. just rely on your chemicals. There's agronomic practices, there's cultivation, there's um, crop rotation, there's sanitation, there's all these things that come into play. But I think we've come to a point in the world where our agricultural producers are relying too heavily on the chemicals without thinking about the other practice that can help them to overcome their pest disease and weed problem. Um, with other way, ways of doing that particular control and not just going for just nuke it with the chemicals because it ain't going to work because we've got climate change, we've got excessive heat or excessive droughts or we've got excessive rain and excessive cold temperatures. So you've got to work yourself into the changes and that is Darwinism. If you don't change with the seasons, you're not going to make it because Darwin said survival of the most um, adaptable and we need to be adaptable mm -hmm. to the changing conditions and that's what I need <laughs> to farmers to go forward. Yeah, Gerard, adapt to perish and I think I think you've touched on some some topics that are hotly debated in the scientific world as well. I know that you no know, till and till a lot of um, entomologists, um, pest biologists, they sit on various um, sides of the coin with regard to that when it comes to pest management in particular. So yeah, I fully hear you there, Gerard. And yeah, I think you also make a good point that uh, maybe doing a bit of tilling um, after every five years or so, it's not really going to change the the no-till management practice um, in 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 that sense. So that's a good point there, Gerard. But I'm not going to let you off the hook just like that because I it's think fine. there's there, there's probably another two questions um, that are probably sitting on everyone's mind, and I think you've answered the third one more or less um, throughout this. Um, conversation but for me it's when it gets to number four now Gerard and I'm, and I'm gonna put this question to you all right so regarding the terms hydrolysis and sap saponification in this context would one be correct in assuming that pyrethroid formulations may differ in their quality which may then affect the quality of the tank mix where glyphosate for example is to be added and perhaps we could also consider glyphosate formulations here as well. So in simple terms, Gerard, are there perhaps quality differences in pyrethroid formulations when considering older and newer generation formulations? Yeah, I think that's something, no, yeah. So yeah. I think that's a, that, that, that's one aspect we have not quite looked at. Um, 
And I think it's also an important uh, piece of information to yeah. consider when looking at this. No, well, I so, so, on, so my, uh, yeah. So what I'm saying, Gerard, could the farmer not have maybe had an older generation product that maybe all didn't work too well with the glyphosate and then maybe given the, the explosion with the weather and the outbreaks that occurred after that, given that you've said to me all other management practices were on point, could that maybe not have uh, exacerbated the problem further as well? In that given that now you've got an even larger outbreak that the formulations maybe he was using in the past could control it because the outbreak was not as severe, but when it got severe and conditions got particularly optimal for them, that formulation couldn't quite do the job um, per se. So, so I'm putting that question to you, um, Gerard. Yeah, um, the two words you mentioned there are heavy terms for most people. So this hydrolysis yeah. and saponification. So hydrolysis is normally used in organic chemistry as the process of breaking the molecule apart by acidic um, environment. In other words, if you take um, a pyrethroid and you add a strong acid like um, nitric acid or sulfuric acid or even phosphoric acid to it, it will start breaking up the molecule by adding protons to the molecule and then those protonated sites get attacked by the water, what else is in the water, and break the molecule apart. The, the other side of the coin is saponification. Saponification is where you where you attack a molecule with a base, like for example potassium hydroxide or isopropylamine or triethylamine, which is very often used as salts or salt forming agents in, in our pesticides. And saponification is often as bad as hydrolysis. Now the question is, is it possible in a tank mixture between um, two mm. different pesticides? And the, the answer is yes. It might not be total certification mm. or hydrolysis. It might only be a small part of it. It might only be one or two or five or so percent. But you also mentioned now in the exceptional circumstance where we had this massive outbreak, yeah, it might have had an influence because instead of having 100% glyphosate in your tank, and 100% of the pyrethroid in your tank, you might mm. now sitting at maybe 70% or 80% of that active because mm. part of the molecule was either hydrolyzed yeah. or saponified because of the water conditions created by poor water quality or by adding mm. in another molecule into it. And then the, the pest um, pressure, <coughs> sorry, was so high that you didn't get the effective dosage per hectare that you required to wipe the pest out. So yeah, these things are important and it also depends. You also mentioned now old versus new. Remember, old is not always bad. There are some of the older yeah. chemicals been around longer sure. than you and I've been alive that are still 100% on the dot. Yeah. Uh, but there might be new, chemis new chemistry and new formulation types that are more effective because they protect mm. the molecule. And if you look at the pyrethroids, you will see many of the pyrethroids now carry the thing or the, the acronym behind them as a CS. In other words, it's a microencapsulated molecule. So there's a little, mm. a little dome protecting the, the molecule and it slowly releases the molecule into the environment. So when you put that molecule then into poor water quality, the molecule has a much better chance of surviving a poor water environment than a naked molecule sitting in the same water environment. So chemistry is very complex and that's why um, I always tell people don't do anything which is not on the label because every product is different from the other one. You often hear from our market and amongst the farmers. Yeah, but cypermethane is cypermethane. doesn't matter whether you buy from company A, B or C. It is not. Mm. There is yeah. never, there cannot be two formulations which are identical unless they are made by the same company and poured into two different containers and they put two different labels on them. That mm -hmm. is total chemical equivalence. But don't tell me, for example, the company X that gets their product made in South Africa is the same as company Y that gets their product made in Switzerland or China for that matter, because there are different types of ways in which the, the chemical engineers formulate these things. And that's why the compatibility becomes a big issue. And we've seen it time and again, where people make a tank mix and they can't find what they used to, they buy something else and mm. make a tank mix, oops, and then the poor pays the fan, the crop damage or fighter as we call it, or it doesn't work and the pest runs away or the wheat runs away because it is not compatible. So 
these things are reality of chemistry and chemistry like i say again it is uh, most people fear chemistry i love chemistry because to me it's a simple science i understand it but i do understand it can be exceptionally difficult for most people to understand the smaller intricacies of chemistry and that's what makes it exciting for me to be in the in the field of agrochemicals because i look at all these little things but my plea then to people is don't do something which is not on the label because you've got no guarantee that what you're doing is going to give you the right result. And at the worst, you're going to lose your entire crop. At best, you're going to have low, um, lower yields because of ineffective control of the pest. So, and especially now, we're talking today about the cutworm, changing climate conditions. Uh, it, it has a profound effect on the way in which the pest operate. So don't take a chance and try and be clever and making up a concoction that's not supposed to be made up because you're going to get caught short by the pest adapting themselves rapidly to changing the environment where people seem to be changing the least of all. And um, I find it difficult to understand because we are supposed to be the most intelligent of organisms in the world. And yet we don't look at the changes in the climate and the changes of the pests and how they operate and adapt to them to make sure we can still keep them under control to get the best yield off our lands for the benefit of the farmer's pocket. And I really feel for the farmers because some people in those years where the outbreaks had massive, massive losses. They barely made it out of the, um, mm. the first season, but luckily most of them made a plan and they adopted a different agronomic sort of environment or agro yeah, agricultural environment or agricultural practice to overcome the problems they were faced with in the year 2020. Yeah, Gerard, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, that's, um, that's excellent points you make then. From some of my experiences as well, Gerard, when I used to advise people, well, at that time, we, we, we weren't allowed to give out things like your brand names and so forth. So we had to do it on active ingredients. And that's where you make an excellent point that we can give you the name of an active ingredient, but the quality may differ according to brand different formulations, different companies, different patents. Um, yeah. That's just how the world works, Gerard. So it's also up to the, let's put it this way, producer to also do their research, to know, okay, it's this active ingredient that would control the pest 100%, but um, which version of the active ingredient should I use with my with my tank mix person, which would work better with what I'm planning to mix it with, you know, mm. based on labels as well. But I think I think with that said, Gerard, um, it, it definitely puts the point there across as well, that it's not just enough to talk about uh, an active ingredient here, because you'd have to also then consider the brand of the products that were maybe used that may could have had an influence on the mixture and so forth. So I think, yeah, Gerard, um, a lot to come out of this discussion. I think um, there's a lot of um, speculation as well. Um, but I do think we have an idea of 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 what went what what happened. But like you said, in the absence of uh, empirical evidence, we we can't really make a valid conclusion. So um, I think I think the the message is clear here. Um, before looking and 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 um, communicating resistance, um, look at all other angles first um, because it it could be a minor issue that may need a tweak and, and it may not um, require a drastic change up front. So maybe with your farmer, Gerard, it was different 100%. Maybe with another farmer, it might not be that case. Maybe there's something wrong with the pH of his water that could be affecting the, the efficacy of the pyrethroid formulation and so forth. So, and that goes back to what we've said, different, uh, different shoe size for everyone. So. Um, it's it's never going to be the same issue on each farm. It's going to be different. Um, but with that being said, um, I think producers need to understand when you when you use the term resistance, it's a it's a powerful term because now you 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 basically labeling the active ingredient as not being effective. So yeah. you look at look at things from a holistic approach, look at everything all the way down to your tanks, to the pH of your spray water, to the calibration of your sprayers, to the compatibility of the products you're mixing, if where, where farmers are doing that. And also look at the spraying conditions in terms of when are you spraying, are the conduce, conditions suitable to spraying and so forth. So I think, Gerard, there's a lot of speculation that can go into this. You've made good points. 
Um, there's been good points made in the media as well from, from certain other individuals. Um, but like I say, Gerard, one thing we know for sure is that it's not a resistance issue um, based on, on, on what we have in front of us in terms of the information. It would point to possibly um, something else, and it would probably be specific for each farm as well from, from the way I see it now in terms of why this actually went wrong. Um, so, Gerard, um, from my side, thank you very much for, for making the time to come and speak to us. I think this panel discussion was very good. I think from my side as well, you've cleared up a lot of points. Um, following somebody who speaks in chemical terms is never easy, but I think um, you put it to us in, a, in an understandable manner that we could follow. And you've made excellent points as well, Gerard. And I must also say to you, well done for you not being an entomologist, but leading um, the, the, the media outcry that went on at that time. Um, also phoning me to check in with me, what's the story, uh, are you receiving reports? I must really take my, my hats off to you, Gerard, that is quite commendable. And um, based on what you have said as well, you're probably the person in the know to be speaking on it, given that you have been dealing with the topic. So I couldn't think of anyone better, Gerard, and in your capacity as an organic chemist, I think that's come through very well during this panel discussion as well. So Gerard, Thank you so much. Um, have a lack a day much. further. And I think you. I think you've also put, put things into perspective quite nicely for, for all the attendees here today. Thank you, Gerard. Okay, so everyone, let's move on. Okay, so now just in terms of my concluding remarks, well, as I've mentioned, it's clear that a lot still remains unknown. And while we have tried to pinpoint the problem, all we still have really in scientific terms are opinions which remain speculative based on the reports that, that have come in, which in itself is not a representative sample size either and would require so, and would require proof in some sort some form of validated data. Now, in a nutshell, the only way to know the exact answer is to have clear evidence. Now, some out there may have evidence, but this is not publicly available or may not yet be publicly available. And therefore, our advice to producers or to anyone following this, um, this topic is to always stay updated with, with new information coming out. Um, that's always the way to keep yourself updated and exclude um, certain possibilities that may have been considered to be problematic. So, Keep updated, keep following um, the agricultural media, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure there is also work going on behind the scenes that will also give us uh, clear answers in time. Uh, I am sure of that. So, so yeah. Um, yeah, but now everyone with all of that said, and I think as I mentioned, Gerard mentioned on the previous slide as well, and now just to um, put this into context as well, the resistance question has been answered. Um, in addition, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, IRAC, um, believes that there are no resistance issues given the available information. However, the committee remains vigilant. So everyone, the aim of this exercise was to also put into context critical thinking when it comes to solving problems by considering all angles. Now, when it comes to tank mixes, consider the compatibility of pesticide formulations. Also consider the conditions of the spray water, spray cal calibrations, and so forth. While the, farmer, while the farmer, as highlighted earlier, took drastic measures by changing the tillage approach, for some farmers, there may just need to be a minor tweak that would solve the issue. We really don't know, guys. Now, to me, finding out whether crop residues have a potential negative impact on pyrethroid application efficacy against cutworms, particularly during very wet uh, conditions in different regions, may be useful in my opinion. And then finally, the importance of timeless and efficient weed control needs to be understood by all far farmers when it comes to cutworm as well. I think those points came out quite clearly through the discussion as well. So everyone, when it comes to pesticide products, users must ensure that label instructions in terms of storage, application, and disposal are being adhered to without deviation in any manner whatsoever when using a pesticide product. 
It does not only pertain to when you're applying the product. Now, why am I stressing this? Simple, because the label of a pesticide product is a legal document covered under Act Number 36 of 1947. And the message cannot be clear. clearer. Do not go off label. In addition, end users can be assured that the product will be effective in controlling the target pest while posing no risk to humans, animals, or the environment. Moving on, Crop Life South Africa encourages all producers to actively scout and keep well-managed pest records in order to maintain crop protection costs at sustainable levels. By keeping records over time of all observations, this will help producers in particular to make informed decisions pertaining to their management strategies, allowing for fine tweaking or adjustments where necessary. Secondly, these records combined with weather data may be useful in predicting infestation patterns in following seasons. Given uh, the current South African economic woes, producers, in my opinion, need to be smarter in how they do business, where decisions must be informed by data evidence in order to save on costs in all facets. Finally, as I mentioned, cutworms have been relatively well managed in South Africa and will continue to be. I have no doubt of this. When there are issues with control, and as we have done today in this exercise, explore all possibilities before reporting suspected resistance and making drastic changes. Keep calm, ask questions by considering all angles and find solutions. Now, before I move on from this slide, I don't see any questions in the chat box. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's good to then up. So yeah, everyone, with that, it now brings to a close um, this webinar session. And as the slide says, hope you enjoyed and learned something. And then yeah, thank you. Thank you all for listening. And for those of you who may have any further questions or would like to chat further around this topic, please feel free to contact me via cell or email. I know for some of the guys that are here, who 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 may who may know me previously as an entomologist? I'm still very interested in entomological matters at ground level, so please keep me updated. Um, some of our members who are here um, also um, sent through some technical documents. Um, if you guys have, let me have a look and stay updated with things as well. Currently, I'm looking at a a, a lot more at um, checklists, regulations, more sort of business management, but. Yeah, I still remain an entomologist at heart. So in, in closing, all the very best to everyone that will be doing the assessment as well. I think if you listened and concentrated during this training session, 100% should be the order of the day. Um, now, cutworm, uh, cutworm topic, um, given my experiences previously, this is probably the longest session I've had talking about cutworms. Um, it's like I mentioned at the start, it, it hasn't really been considered to be a pest of importance. So, yeah, it was an exper interesting experience for me as well. When I delved into this uh, topic, um, I spoke to Gerard, I spoke to a lot of others as well. Um, but yeah, I think I hope I've made it interesting. I know cutworm management uh, topic like that can be boring to many. So for you, all of you who have attended, I hope it was it was interesting as well. And then finally, everyone, thank you all again for being part of this webinar training session. I really appreciate it. Um, the more attendees I get, the better. I can start catching up Gerard in the numbers there. We've got a little competition going. And then, yeah, with that said, everyone, um, have a great weekend. And yeah, cheers to everybody. Enjoy.